We're very concerned that the rules for employment insurance will no longer be as clear as they once were. We're very concerned that the legislation that we're looking at, the law, is only going to be a framework. A lot of the details are going to come in regulations. Tom Mulcair reacting to new changes to the EI employment insurance and reaction across the country has been swift and strong after the federal government unveiled sweeping changes to employment insurance program. The Human Resources and Skills Development Minister Diane Finley this morning announcing details of the plan that we've been asking for for a long time to overhaul benefits for out-of-work Canadians. Let me show you the highlight in our hot sheet. The changes include tight new rules for frequent, occasional, and long-tenured applicants. Those are three new categories. All claimants will be required to accept lower-paying jobs. There are new definitions now for suitable work and reasonable job search. What are they? We'll find out. But they could mean longer commutes for some Canadians. And EI will be linked with temporary foreign workers program. That means employers will have to exhaust options for Canadian employees before hiring foreign workers. And EI recipients will receive two job alert emails a day. Right now, they only get three alerts every two weeks. Still, lots of questions about the details, some very significant changes there to how this federal program will actually unfold. Will it actually help fill labor shortage and boost the national economy, or does it punish Canadians who lose their jobs? Seasonal workers, for example, does it hamper employees who rely on those seasonal workers? Joining me now, the Minister of Human Resources, Diane Finley. Minister, good to have you back. So the, the details finally came out. The, the first detail, and we've seen some of them, is the question of defining what suitable work is. It's based on several criteria, and we talk about commuting distance, regular or irregular hours. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, wiggle room there. Can you give us a how you will actually define and determine what suitable work is? Okay, well, it's going to vary by individual circumstances and by local working conditions and local labor market situation. So it's going to be governed by common sense, but we'll start out with things like what's known as uh, the National Occupation Code. So what is the profession? What are the skill levels? What are, are those skills portable to other industries or sectors? And so we're going to start with that as to whether it's suitable. Is it in the same pay range? Does the person qualified? Is it local? Because we're not going to force people to move across the country. Is it local? It's all going to be common sense. Does it pay enough to warrant the effort? For example, we're not going to have somebody commute three hours for minimum wage, especially if they have to pay for child care. It's all going to be based on common sense and be fair and reasonable. And who determines it? I mean, th this is the real question. Who determines what it is? It well, that'll be uh, the people at Service Canada who specialize in EI. They will be extensively trained in how to recognize what the skills are, whether they're portable, and what's suitable for the person. Will there be money to retrain them for that? Uh, in other words, I know there's $21 million, and we'll talk about where that's going, but is mm -hmm. there any new money on to determine that, to train for that? Well, our, our EI people are always seeing changes in the program, and we're training them virtually every day to make sure that they are up to speed and that they are aware of what the opportunities for clients are. Uh, the discretion as to who defines that, again, I mean, the opposition mm -hmm. is going to say, this is all up to the minister. You can define an aid today mm -hmm. and then change the definition tomorrow. Is it at no. your discretion, essentially? No, it's not. The uh, Canadian Employment Insurance Commission will be developing recommendations for regulation. Uh, once they've approved those, then they go to the governor and council for approval. But they will be based on common sense, reasonableness. What we're trying to do here is help Canadians get back to work faster. Get rid of some of the barriers and obstacles that exist within the system that when, keep them from working. When will that be developed out of interest? Do you have a timeline on that? Well, there are a number of components to it. Uh, for example, come the 1st of August, people who are on EI will be able to work part-time and keep half of the money that they make. Right now, it gets clawed back dollar for dollar, which is a real disincentive to taking part-time work. And we know part-time work often leads to full-time. So there are a number of changes that will be coming to effect first one starts August of this summer, but some of them go through to next spring or even beyond that. One of the big concerns are these three categories that we mentioned at the top of the program, that you're def dividing the, uh, the uh, categories into the EI recipients. One of them will be frequent EI recipients, and that will really be the seasonal workers. And, you know, you've got them in your writing, whether they're uh, fruit pickers or whether you've got fishermen. Uh, mm -hmm. There's all sorts of categories of seasonal work. They will t take any work at a 30% pay cut after seven weeks on EI. 
how do you not see that as penalizing seasonal workers? I mean, they got to take a 30% pay cut, and they, you know, this is their life. Well, they, what we're trying to do is encourage them to accept other work. Uh, we do know that in too many cases, in the seasonal sector, there are people who work, who go and claim EI, and then the employer needs to go find other people and often ends up bringing in temporary foreign workers to fill those jobs at a much greater expense when there are actually people locally with the skills and, and the qualifications to do the job. So we're trying to encourage people to keep working. But remember, too, that EI only pays a maximum of 55% of your previous salary. 70% right. is better than 55 so, but I, again, for these people that, you know, sort of year after year, what is supposed to happen to that? I mean, let's just take the person, the crab fishery, for example, or any fishery, and, the, you know, they, they work during that season. And we've got premier gigs from uh, Prince Edward Island where they've got a, a lot of people who use, as a percentage of their population, uh, EI because of the seasonal work. They're concerned that those people will be penalized. Oh, well, it, it, there's no way they're penalized if they continue to work, Right. If they are looking for work and work is available that meets the qualifications and it's local, yeah, we expect them to take that work before employers go offshore looking. But if you're an employer and you know, I'm, you know, if I'm an employer and I know this person's only going to work for me for four or five months because I know that they're, they're going to work back in the fisheries or something, uh, why would I want that person to fill in for five months and then have to retrain and rehire someone? It's just expensive. Why not then bring in a temporary foreign worker, they get... Uh, you, you know, less pay based on the average pay, right, with the new regulations, at least we know they get stability. What's stopping the employer from doing that? Well, even for the first employer who is in the fisheries, they need to have st a stable workforce too, not to have a lot of turnover. And but they right can't now, afford to keep them all season. You know that. I mean, that's the whole well, nature they, of the seasonal work. But, they, but no, but even during the season, they're hiring over and the turnover can be very, very high. We need those people to continue working because we do know of cases where uh, the, they can't complete the harvest because they haven't got enough people willing to take the job. They're, they're on EI. We need to change that. But we also need to take a look at diversifying economies. We'll be working with the provinces to help create new jobs that are counter-cyclical. Uh, people who are, for example, work in the construction industry in summer outside. You know, there's a lot of work being done inside on home renovation, too and maybe there's an opportunity there. We want to help them use their skills and keep them at work so that we do not have to have as many foreign workers coming in because that's so much more expensive for the employers. You're putting $21 million in the budget over two years to fund these changes. Most of it will go to these uh, job alerts. This is essentially alerting people now twice a day of job availabilities as opposed to twice or three times every two weeks. That's ba what happens if there's uh, someone on EI who doesn't have email access. I mean, how do, they, how do we assume that that's going to be useful for them? Well, as I said, this is all going to be based on individual circumstances, and recognizing regional differences. And when people sign up for EI, we'll find out, do they have access to email? If so, where and how? Are we going to, how are we going to contact them? How are we going to make sure that they're aware of the jobs? Because a lot of times well, they're you, not aware. Would, would you phone them? I that's mean, in what that's one option that's an option. But what we're trying to do is help people get to work faster and how, how, the question of enforcement mm -hmm. um, who will enforce this and uh, who takes a suitable job how long you've worked I mean there's a lot more rigorous enforcement that's needed is there any money mm -hmm. going to that how would that that's be that's part that's partly covered there already uh, in the funding that you mentioned the 21 million covers enforcement as well. but we already have uh, an integrity unit and what they're going to be doing is taking a closer look at, at really high-risk claimants and saying right are you aware of the responsibilities? And when people sign up for EI, we're going to make sure that they do know they have a responsibility to look for work on a daily basis and to accept a job if it's suitable. That's but, always but been their tax. We're just clarifying it for them. Now. But you know, those integrity, those people that check up on that. I mean, they're taxed already. You know, we've had lots of stories about how EI checks mm -hmm. are being processed very slowly. The system's already slow. Will this those further? Are, those are different people. But I mean, the and system's clearly not. I mean, it's burdened already. I mean, will that twenty-one million dollars do enough to enforce? Well, we're going to keep an eye on the situation and do all we can. But what we want to do is make sure that people have the barriers to taking a job are removed which they've been there within the system so get the system out of the way to help people get back to work 
make sure they know that jobs are there, and provide them with motivation to make sure they're making more money for their families. Did you? Con some are saying there was not enough consultation on this. I mean, I asked you last week for details. Now there's details mm -hmm. coming. Uh, the provinces, a lot of them said, we weren't consulted enough on this. Uh, uh, did you consult with provinces? I got Premier no. Giz from Prince Edward Island. Did you consult with him on this? EI is a federal program. Uh, the EI Part 2, which is on the ground helping people get back to work, you know, we, we, the provinces are responsible for that. We devolved it with funding. Uh, but I've been, and my colleagues have been listening to employers and employees right across the country for many, many months. And we've heard about the job shortage, or sorry, about the skills and labor shortages that are keeping businesses from completing a first shift, going to a second shift. They're saying we need people at work. And we've got people on EI. We've got hundreds of people in Calgary or in Alberta who are classed as food counter servers, right? Hundreds of people on EI, and yet we're bringing in over a thousand temporary foreign workers. And, and there's to no fill question the jobs. about that. But but I guess the, the provinces will say if this doesn't work, if more people get thrown, can't get work. We'll pick up the tab. So did you talk to the premiers? I've, and especially in provinces, you know, look, you got Newfoundland and Labrador, Kathy mm -hmm. Dunderdale, uh, concerned about this, uh, Prince Edward Island, that are worried about this. Yeah. They're going to pick up the tab. Did you talk to them? I've, I've been speaking with my ministerial counterparts in the provinces, and they're, for the most part, quite eager to work with us on this. It's in their best interest to have people back at work. I've spoken with several of them today, and they were very welcoming of the opportunity to work together on this to help Canadians get back to work. Uh, one, one last question here. When I look at the number of temporary foreign workers here, according to Stats Canada, you know, it, it's not a huge number, but it's a pretty big program. I mean, but there's hundreds, of, you know, you got St. John's area, 416 people in Halifax, 2,400. I mean, it's a, a legitimate number. But you've still got 700,000 people in Canada that don't collect EI, that are unemployed, over 700. That is the assumption here, and some critics will say, where are all these mystical jobs that are being taken up by not a huge number of temporary foreign workers? I think there's only 300,000 across the country. But there's 700,000 Canadians that don't collect EI. Why aren't they flooding these jobs? Or, as some critics say, those jobs don't exist for these people. Well, I'm not sure where that number came from. It's not one that we deal with. Uh, we take a look at the people who are eligible for EI. In other words, they've paid premiums and they've worked the hours that are required. It's like any other insurance But how many program. people don't qualify that are unemployed in Canada? We, we out, of, out of the people that, that pay into it, those uh, people... Uh, actually, 83% of them. Qualify. No, those are the paid into, but they're still yeah. unemployed Canadians that are looking for work that don't pay into EI, well, so don't collect. And, that, but and so, are they supposed to find these jobs? Well, no, but we have programs with the provinces that help them look for that. They're through what's known as labor market agreements, and they have full access to the job bank. Uh, they can sign up for these other programs that help them find jobs. Could you put more money to into skills them. retraining? I mean, you got the 21 million to job alerts. Could there be more mm -hmm. money? And they, you know the NDP is going to say more money for job retraining and skills retraining, less money for job alerts. We've, we're spending unprecedented numbers, dollars, on getting people the skills and training that they need for the jobs of today and tomorrow. During the Economic Action Plan 1, uh, we made tremendous investments to help people get skills for the new job, get reskilled. But once they've got the skills, we've got to get them into the jobs. So right now, the focus is on helping them find the jobs. And that's where we're going. We're making sure that the skills and talents we do have are at work. All right, uh, Minister, the details uh, coming early this morning uh, from Diane Finley. Thanks for coming in. My pleasure.